بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Yeah, mashallah, you're pretty ripped, man. You're pretty jacked. Uh, I see with the tank top photos <laughs> sometimes. I'm like, yo, okay. I see. <laughs> you you watch any shows with your wife or anything? You like anime? Yeah, yeah I'd, I've never watched anime before. That's one thing. Everyone keeps saying like, oh, you should watch Bleach and watch all these different anime. I haven't watched anime since Dragon Ball Z, if that counts as anime. <laughs> You got to watch anime, man. Yeah, when I was a kid, I watched Dragon Ball Z. That's about it. I'm not really a big um, TV person. If my wife picks something and she's like, oh, there's this new movie, there's this out, there's that, I'll, I'll like watch it that with her. But me personally, I don't really have that many shows that I'm into. I like to read more than watch TV. Of course you do. If you write a book, I feel like that's that's <laughs> that's what you like to do. You like to read. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. What do you read? Well, do you read Islamic books as well? Yes, yeah, so I read Islamic books a lot, to be honest. Um, that's my favorite subjects. So I read a lot of Islamic books and a lot of history books. I'm not really into the um, like self-development or self-improvement books, personally. Um, there's a few authors that I, I've read their stuff. Like I liked Robert Greene, but I liked him more for the historical elements. Because when I read his book, there was a lot of history. So he has like um 48 laws of power and he has a few others um and he for every like rule that he brings then he brings like a story or you know different historical accounts so in terms of the moral standing of the book i mean obviously everybody has their opinions on that that it's not a good book and whatever but in terms of just from a purely historical perspective to see how historical figures have um, obtained and exercised power i feel like it's an amazing book um, with the historical research and the analysis that has happened and you get to learn about different areas of history um, i'm currently i just finished a book that was about islamic history in 30 personalities so it was looking at 30 different people that have influenced the muslim world and the history of the muslim world and then i'm reading a book now currently on the ottomans because that's something i've always kind of wanted to be more interested in ever since article came out there's another book i'm reading called 1492 and it's about the columbus's discovery of the americas and how that changed the world so there's a few few books that i'm i'm currently reading i'm one of those crazy people that like i can never read one book at a time i'll read about five books and i'll just read like a chapter of each book rather than just starting with one book and then finishing it and then moving on to another book and if i go out and i see like a bookshop and I, there's a book that i like i'll just buy it that's one thing i always i've always spent money on and i always spend money on his books Mashallah, that's so, awesome man yeah. And then that's on top of Islamic books that I'm reading, Arabic books. Do you have a favorite historical figure? I don't want to be cliche and say the Prophet. <laughs> yeah, the prophet that's a good one. After him, I, I would say personally, the, the, the teacher of my teachers, Sheikh Ibrahim Nias, is one of my favorite Islamic, um, Islamic figures in the, the world. The teacher of your teacher? Yeah, he's the teacher of all of my, most of my teachers are students of Sheikh Ibrahim or they're students of students of Sheikh Ibrahim. So Sheikh Ibrahim, know. what's his last name? Yes, he's from Senegal. Yeah, he's from uh, Senegal. Who, who's, yeah. Like, who's this guy? What's his story? It's a very long story, man. It's a very, very long story. But essentially, he was a Senegalese scholar. He was born in the year 1900 and he passed away in 1975. And he started off, you know, as a local scholar in Senegal. He was the son of uh, another scholar called Al-Haji Abdullah Nias, who was a mujahid. He used to do jihad against the French when they were trying to colonize Senegal. And he grew up, he was known for tafsir, he was known for tasawwuf, he was known for, you know, spiritual knowledge as well as uh, book knowledge. And he attracted loads of students from Mauritania, from Gambia, from 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 as far away as Nigeria, Ghana, etc. And then in the 50s and the 60s, his life became very interesting because he started to play more of a role in the wider Muslim world. So he went to um, Nigeria first, for example, and he had many followers there, many students there, and then to Ghana. And then from Ghana, he became connected with the president, Kwame Nkrumah who was fighting for West African independence from colonization. And so Kwame Nkrumah and Sheikh Ibrahim worked together in the project of, you know, Pan-Africanism and in the project of independence. And then Kwame Nkrumah in, uh, introduced him to Gamal Abdel Nasser, 
he started to travel to Egypt. He became part of the scholar, the Council of Scholars of the Ulama of Azhar. He became named Sheikh Al Islam by Sheikh Mahmoud Shaltut and the and the Ulama in in Egypt. He led Salat Salat al Juma in 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 Azhar Mosque. And just recently, Osama Al Azhari was talking about him on TV and the role that he played in you know uh, politics of the Arab world. He was close friends with uh, Sharif Ibrahim, uh, Sharif uh, Al Husseini, who was the leader of Palestine during the time when Israel was being established. So he was very vocal in his support of the Palestinian cause during the 50s and the 60s, when all of the things like the Six Day War, etc., were happening. He became a part of the. He became the vice president of the Muslim World League in Saudi Arabia, with King uh, Fahad. And he was one of the seven founding members. And so that saw him, you know, being one of the major ulama in the in the world that were helping the ulama come up with different solutions and different um, different remedies to the problems that the Muslims were facing. He had a good relationship with the king of Morocco. So by the end of the 60s, you saw him, like in most of the countries in the Muslim world, he played a major role either politically or religiously or, you know, spiritually. And he's a black West African scholar and somebody that for m most people, even people who do know him, they don't know that side of him. And so he's someone that had a hand in and played a major role in most of the developments that happened in a lot of the Muslim societies across the world in the past century. But yet, you know, he started we could say from humble beginnings he never went to a university everything he learned he studied with his father in his village in senegal but from the knowledge that he had and the spiritual station that he had and his humble origins he was able to affect the world and so i feel like that's a story that's very inspirational for anyone coming from anywhere because me for example i have more resources at hand and i have more opportunities to change the world than Sheikh Ibrahim did at his time. And so if somebody coming from a small village in West Africa at a time when there's no internet, there's no social media, there's no, his village didn't even have electricity until recently, for him to be able to travel the world and do all of these things and inspire and affect the lives of all these millions of people, it just shows you what you can achieve if you study and devote your life to the Prophet wasallam and serving his religion and the way that Allah can use you to support the deen and the way that Allah can use you to uh, support humanity. So, yeah, I would say that was, uh, yeah, that's one of my favorite historical figures. <laughs> that's beautiful, man. That's but the reason so why, I, with the, sorry to interrupt, the reason why I started and I, Prophet wasallam is because Shah Ibrahim is an amazing example of somebody but his entire strength and all of the things that he did, he took from the love that he had for the Prophet wasallam and the love that he had for the deen of Islam. And we have thousands of scholars that are like that. We have thousands of ulama, thousands of awliya, thousands of salihin, people who you know have done amazing things throughout history since the time of the Prophet wasallam until today. And each and every one of them, if you were to ask them who their role model was, who the person who they looked to for guidance was, who the person who inspired them the most was, they would all say the Prophet wasallam. So I feel like it's amazing for you to be one person that does amazing things, but then for you to be the one person that not only did you do amazing things, but you inspired hundreds of thousands of other people who are held as role models. I think that's a, a greater feat and there's nobody in the history of mankind who's done that the way the Prophet ﷺ has done that. So if we look today, for example, people look up to Malcolm X, but Malcolm X was a Muslim and he looked up to the Prophet ﷺ. People look up to Muhammad Ali, people look up to Muhammad Al-Fatih who opened Constantinople, people look up to you know, uh, Salahuddin Ayyubi who conquered Jerusalem for the Muslims, people who people look up to Ertugol, if they watch the Ertugol series, people look up to Mansa Musa, who was the wealthiest man who ever lived from West Africa. People look up to all of these historical figures that have done amazing things historically. But each and every one of those people were Muslims, and each and every one of those people looked to the Prophet. So I feel like that's the most inspirational thing for me is that him, just as one man, he was able to affect all these millions of people who are people who everybody else looks up to. So everyone looks up to these people, but these people look to the Prophet So 
historically he's the most influential man that has ever lived and if we go to his grave today something that i found amazing doing ziara going to medina munawara is that there's not a second of the day when somebody is not at the grave of the prophet sallam sending him salam and there's not a second of the day when someone is praying and they're two billion muslims let's say even only 50 percent of the muslims pray that's one billion people every day saying Assalamu alayka ayyuhal nabi wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh sending salam on the Prophet and saying Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad kama salli ala Ibrahim wa ali Ibrahim and praying for the Prophet sallallahu There's no one else in the history of mankind that has that. That every single second of the day, the place where you're buried, somebody is greeting you, someone's praying for you. And every single place in the face of the earth, every single country, every single town, every single city, there's at least one person praying for you and sending salah and salam on you. Only the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has that. That's a, that's a beautiful reflection. You're, you're yeah. so right. Yeah, He's the role model of role models. He's the role model of role models. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about the, the Lion King? I love his, I love his nickname. <laughs> Sunjata. Sunjata, uh, he was the founder of the Mali Empire. And he was Muslim. And um, he gathered together. It's a long story, but basically, Sunjata was the prince of the Mali kingdom. It was a kingdom at the time. And he was the son of his father's third wife. But that was the wife that they said. There were two hunters that brought her and said that she was going to be the one that was going to deliver the person, that would deliver the son that was going to become the king after him. Uh, and so in his youth, he couldn't walk. Whoa, hold up. That's, that's really mystical. So yeah, two yeah. hunters it's like, came. It's a very mystical story. If you read the actual story, it's like a very mystical story. Um, but basically, yeah, there were these two hunters. And hunters in West African society were known for their... Because, you know, they're always in the forest. And the forest is where all the jinn live and all the spirits live and all of these kind of... So hunters, traditionally in West African society, are people who have closer contact with the spirit world than people who live in the cities or the towns. So these hunters, they brought this lady and people had already told him that the wife that is going to give birth to his successor hasn't arrived yet. And the hunters brought this lady to marry him and she became his wife. Um, and so when, when, when she gave birth to her son, Sunjata, he was named Marijata, which means like the, 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 the lion prince or the lion, the young lion. And um, he couldn't walk. And so the other wives would make fun of that wife because her son couldn't walk and they would bully him, etc. Until one day, you know, he overcame. When he was in, he was about seven or eight, he managed to get like some crutches made and he started to teach himself how to walk. And he was known for his strength. He was known for his ability to fight. He was known for his bravery. And when his father died, his oldest brother exiled him and his mother. Um, and attempted to kill them. So they went to Gao, which was a Muslim kingdom, like a real Muslim kingdom, and they lived there. And then somebody else came and took over the territories of the Mali Empire. And this story actually brings me into something else that I want to discuss in terms of my next book. But the person that took over the kingdom of Mali Empire was a blacksmith, and his name was Sumaru Kunate. And what's interesting about the oral historians, when they talk about him, they said that, he had so much, so they describe him as a magician and someone that had magic powers, but they describe the fact that he was a metal worker. And so they said the capital city that he built, it had walls that were made of metal and it had buildings and towers that were reinforced with metal. And that's a time when people were living in houses reinforced by wood and stone and mud. And the tower that he lived was a tower that had like maybe seven or eight stories and it was made of metal. And this is in the 1200s. Uh, and I'll tell you why this is important. But remember that I said that. I'll come back to the story after. But essentially, Sunjata gathered an army. He traveled through West Africa. And he united 12 different kingdoms to form a coalition to defeat this king, Sumaru Kunate. Because he was an evil king, he would kill people, he would sacrifice people, and he would do all kind of crazy stuff. And so they ended up defeating him. They burnt his city to the ground. 
and then Sunjata was established himself as the emperor of the Mali Empire. He united the twelve kingdoms, and um, his general, his right hand man, was his younger brother Mandingbori Keita. And Mandingbori Keita ended up becoming the king. The, he didn't become the king after him, but his sons became the king after him. And then Mandingbori's grandson was Mansa Musa, the famous Mansa Musa. What's interesting about uh, Sunjata's story as well is that he he established what was one of the first charters of human rights when he established the Mali Empire because he set about and this was called the Manden Charter and it was um, registered by UNESCO as one of the uh, world heritage you know the things of world heritage human history and world heritage that was one of the first charters of human rights because it gave everyone the right to freedom the right to religious freedom the right to not be enslaved and all of these things were established in the in the charter that established the Mali Empire. What's interesting about this Sumaru Konate story is that when I went to Cornell University, which is an Ivy League university, I was speaking with a professor about this story. And he pointed out that when people say Sumaru Konate had such a mastery of metal that he was able to build towers and seven story buildings, etc. That shows that if he hadn't been defeated, maybe Africa could have been on their way to have an industrial revolution the same time as Europe or even before Europe. Because when he was defeated, the artisan caste, who were the people who actually make things and produce boats, etc., were subjugated and then the trading caste were placed on top of them. So if the traders rule the society, they don't care about production or producing things, they care about buying and selling things. Whereas if Sumaya Kunate had continued in that trajectory to the point that he had the technology to build story buildings with reinforced metal, that's equivalent to like what we see today being built in terms of skyscrapers or multi-story buildings. Maybe if he had been allowed to continue or his cast of people who were the metal workers had been placed in a more senior position, then the history of Africa would have changed. So it's interesting to see all of these. And I talk about this in one of my forthcoming books. One of my forthcoming books, I'm talking about um, Islam and the makings of the modern world and how different Muslim kingdoms and Muslim empires have affected the history of the world and produced the world that we live in today. Because there's so many aspects of history and society and culture and modern day society that we don't realize stem from Islam, either indirectly or indirectly. Is, so is is that the part that you said to ask you about later? Did you already yeah, address it right part. there? Yeah, that's the part to ask me about later. So we're there now. <laughs> yeah, so they were just building seven story metal towers, basically skyscrapers back then? Yeah. Exactly. What year was this? This was in the 1200s. 1200s i love that what the charter said so this, in your book i got to open right now it says the charter contained a preamble of seven chapters uh, advocating social peace and diversity the inviolability of the human being education the integrity of the motherland food security the abolition of slavery and freedom of expression and trade uh -huh. i was like this sounds very modern yes it sounds very modern so it's interesting for many of us, because we've been disconnected from our history, we don't realize that many of the things that we think are progressive and are part of modern society and are modern inventions were things that our ancestors had been doing and been saying and been, you know, writing books about. But because we're disconnected from that history and that legacy and we haven't been taught to explore it and we haven't been taught to, uh, to appreciate it, we don't know and we don't realize and we don't understand. So in my new book, I speak about that. I speak about, for example, the impact that Muslim scholars had in creating the environment that brought about the European Renaissance. The fact that today, for example, the numbers that we use today, one, two, three, four, five, that are the basis of modern science and technology are called Arabic numerals. And the Europeans learned them from the Muslims because before that they were using Roman numerals and you can't use Roman numerals X and V and I to form the coding and the computers and the technology and the things that we have today. So even us being able to do this podcast, and I'm in Egypt and you're in America, 
and we have this technology. This is all due to coding, which is due to numbers, which the Europeans learned from the Muslims. So this is a baraka from the barakat of the Quran. This is a baraka from the barakat of the Prophet Sallallahu But we never look at it or see things that way. The fact that the oldest university in the world was established by a North African Arab Muslim woman. So many different things I'm going to cover in this, in this new book um, to show how intertwined all of our histories are. And to show how there's so many aspects of history that have been hidden from mainstream retelling of stories. So even, for example, when you study European history, they talk about the Greeks and the Romans. And then it's like they skip the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages. And then they end up in the Renaissance and the Industrial Revolution and the Age of Empire and the Age of Exploration and the Age of Exploitation. But in between that the knowledge of the Greeks and the Romans were lost to the Europeans. And it was the Muslims that had inherited that, translated it from Greek and Roman into Arabic. And then from Arabic, it was retranslated into Latin for the Europeans to be able to have access to the legacy of their ancestors and produce this revolution. Even the defeat of Constantinople, which was the capital of the Roman Empire, which then became Istanbul, the capital of Turkey. That is part of the history that kind of makes the environment that led to the European Renaissance because the scholars that existed in the Roman Empire at the time under, under close to Muslim rule, when the Ottomans took over, then they migrated into Europe and they took the knowledge that they had been learning through from their Muslim neighbors into Europe with them and helped them develop and produce the environment that produces the Renaissance. And then, yeah, there's so many things that it's an interesting tapestry of history that, um, yeah, I've written the new book and I'm just editing it at the moment. But when it's out, inshallah, I think it will open a lot of doors in people's minds to things that they didn't realize were connected before. Oh, man. I want to ask you about this book. Should, yeah. Can I? Should I? Go ahead. Go ahead. Shaykh Mustafa, this is the problem with you, man. There's so many, so much knowledge that you have, mashallah. Well, we, could, we could cut it and do a part two or something. <laughs> yeah, because I'm not even through half my questions. Yeah, yeah, we could do a part two. That's fine. Oh, dude, if if you've been enjoying this and you're willing to, I, I would love to. Yeah, let's do that, inshallah. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, did you see that Neil deGrasse Tyson video where he was talking about how I believe like one fifth of the stars in the universe are named Arabic names because most of the stars discovered in the universe are by a Arabs or yes. at least under the Muslim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's incredible. Yeah. So you weren't always a Muslim, which shocked me. I thought mm. you were born and raised Muslim. I didn't know you converted to Islam. Tell me about your journey to Islam and your life story even. How did you end up finding Islam? How did I end up finding Islam? Um, essentially, so I grew up in London. I was born and raised in London. Uh, my mother is of Gambian and Sierra Leonean origin. My father is Nigerian. And my mother's mother, who's the Gambian one, would always take me to the Gambia when I was young. So I went when I was two years old. I went when I was six years old. I went again when I was 10 years old, and then I kept on going back every year or every other year after that. Um, but the most significant trip that I took that impacted me in a way that brought me closer to Islam was when I was six. Because you know when you're six, you're conscious of what's around, you have memory. You Like, I don't remember my life before I was six, really. Everything up to the age of six is kind of blurry for me. I remember my sixth birthday, and then I remember everything after that. And I remember going to Gambia and seeing people praying Salah in the street and seeing pictures of Shiyukh everywhere and hearing the other and five times a day and hearing they have a tradition in Senegambia between the Adhan and the Iqama of Zuhur and Asr. Most of the Masajid, they play Quran, mostly Husari, and hearing the Quran and, you know, just seeing the deen as part and parcel of the fabric of, of life in the Gambia. And then I reflected and I thought, well, if I'm from here, why am I family Christian and everybody else in the country is Muslim? And what is Islam? Like, what is this religion that everybody here follows? And these beliefs that everybody has, because it seems to be extremely important for them, the fact that they stop everything they're doing five times a day to pray, 
and they're constantly, you know, playing Quran and they're constantly, you know, making reference to their religion. And when I was there, when I was six, it was actually Eid al-Adha. So I saw all of the sheep and the goats and the sacrifice and my grandma's best friend is Muslim. So we went to her house and we celebrated there. And so that kind of sparked my curiosity and I started to research Islam, not just Islam, but research all the other world religions as well. I was very much into like ancient Greek mythology, ancient Egyptian mythology, ancient Roman mythology. I studied like, I read books about Hinduism, I read books about Jainism, I read books about Zoroastrianism, I read books about everything, all the different belief systems. And by the time I was about 11 or 12, I had already decided internally that when I'm older, I want to be Muslim because Islam made the most sense from all of the religions that I saw. And so at the age of 13, um, I, I, around 12, I went back to Gambia again, and then I saw pictures of this same sheikh that I spoke about earlier, Sheikh Ibrahim Nias, and um, I got in contact with some members of his family, and I ended up taking shahada with them. And then when I was in London, he had a great, he had a gra great granddaughter, that lived in London that had a madrasa. So I, st I studied the Quran with her. At the age of 14, 15, I started studying Quran. He had relatives, you know, in in England that I would go and visit, study. Whenever Sheikh Ibrahim's sons would come, I'd be with them. Whenever his grandsons would come, I'd be with them. Whenever I go back to Gambia, Gambia and Senegal is essentially the same country. So I'd just jump in a taxi, go to Senegal, visit them. And then I ended up studying with them when I had spare time. And I just kept on that trajectory until I ended up <laughs> being the way I am now. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> being the Alhamdulillah. Essentially. SubhanAllah, the fact that you converted at the age of 11, 12, or knew that you wanted to convert by then, what, what stood out to you about Islam than all the other religions, especially your own Christian background? Um, the first thing was how logical everything was. So I remember going to church when I was younger and we had to recite something called the Nicene Creed. And the Nicene Creed was essentially like the testament of faith of believing in the Trinity and believing that Jesus was the son of God and all of these things. And that just never made sense to me. I didn't understand how God was three, but yet one at the same time. And then God was the father, and then Jesus was the son, and then the son. And like all the whole con concept that Christianity was based on, what we now know today as Christianity was based on, didn't make sense. And then when you look into the Bible, you realize that that wasn't really the preaching of Jesus in the first place. But when you compare that to Islam, it's very simple. There's one God, and he has messengers who pass on his message to humanity on his behalf. And Jesus is a messenger. Muhammad wasallam is a messenger. Moses is a messenger. All of these things kind of made, it made more sense. And then when you compare it to historical Christianity and the historical teachings of Jesus, you realize that the teachings of the Prophet wasallam are more in line with what Jesus would have taught than what St. Paul and the Catholic Church and the Christian churches invented. 300 years after the death of Jesus, even researching the Nicene Creed and then realizing that the Treaty of Nicaea was when they kind of consolidated their ideology and created what we now know today as mainstream Christianity. All of that kind of understanding that made me think that, yeah, well, Islam sounds a bit more authentic. And then the second thing was the character of the Prophet wasallam. Like I would read about how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was in terms of his humility, in terms of him not wanting the wealth and the power and the influence of the dunya, in terms of his sacrifices, in terms of his good character, in terms of the fact that he is the person that has been historically the most watched or the most observed person in the history of mankind. The fact that there's nothing that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi did that the Sahaba didn't narrate a hadith about. Just the other day, um, Sheikh Muhammad Hamis, one of my teachers, was talking about the fact that there are books written on the hadith about the Prophet Sallallahu turning from left to right. There are books written about his shoes. There are books written about the way he used to eat. There are books written about the most simplest of things. Everything he did was observed and preserved by the companions because of the love and the reverence that they had for him. And so realizing how humble he was and how perfect his character was and how much of a good person he was and how merciful he was and how wise he was and how gentle he was with dealing with people and all of these things, his character kind of won me, won me over. 
And then the third thing, which is very idealistic, but just realizing that Islam, if practiced and implemented properly, seems to have the solutions to most of the problems that the world is facing today. So I remember I watched a video before I took Shahada and Shah Hamza Yusuf was in the video and he was talking about the fact that in Islam, zakah is 2.5% of your wealth. And he said, if we look globally, if everybody that has money took 2.5% of their wealth and they redistributed it to the poorest of the people in society, there would be no world hunger, there would be no global poverty. And so just these simple things, that these rules that Allah has sent down in the Qur'an and through the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, if implemented, would solve most of our issues, would solve most of our problems. Realizing that helped me to kind of think about Islam and realize that it is, you know, a solution. And even if we can't apply it on a global scale and even if we can't apply it on a wider societal scale, if me as an individual applies the Qur'an and the Sunnah in my life, I'll see all of these solutions and I'll see all of these benefits and I'll see all of these barakat. And alhamdulillah, since I became Muslim, I've seen that. I look at the trajectory of my friends and even my relatives who were not Muslim when I wasn't Muslim and then how my life has changed through Islam and how their lives have ended up. And I thank God that I'm in the position I'm, I'm, I'm in and not in another position. So alhamdulillah. Like I would, I feel like becoming Muslim was the best decision I ever made. I don't doubt it, uh, and I've seen the benefit of it in this world, and inshallah, I'll see the benefit of it in the next world. But even if, and we know that the next world is 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 real, but even if the next world isn't real, and even if you know it doesn't, nothing happens. Just the way I've lived my life here as a Muslim, and the doors that Islam has opened for me, in myself, in the peace and that I feel, and in the safety and security and the blessings that I've received through establishing Salah and through practicing Islam and the connections that I've made with Muslim brothers and sisters across the world and just the different side of the world that has opened up for me through Islam. Even if the benefits were just in this dunya, alhamdulillah, it's enough of a benefit, let alone Jannah in the Akhirah and the relationship that we have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Akhirah. SubhanAllah, that's amazing. So what, was there a turning point in, in your studies when you were 11, 12? Was there so, like a a moment that stands out to you where you were like, this this is it. This is the correct religion. This stands out to me. I think it was there was a time, there was a book I read and it was called The Choice by Ahmed Dida. I don't know if you guys remember. I don't know, I don't know how old we are. But even for me, my generation, he was like old school for us. But Ahmed Dida was really popular and basically he used to write all of these different booklets and leaflets and pamphlets to give da'wah to Christians. And they compiled all of these and it was called The Choice Between Islam and Christianity by Ahmed Dida. And I had that book and I remember reading that book from cover to cover and by the time I finished I was like, yeah, I'm definitely, I believe in Islam. Definitely. (laughs) Compared to, you know, being... Christian family and everything like I was active every Sunday my grandma would take me to church I went to Sunday school every Sunday I used to read the Bible I was very familiar and that's something even that impressed me about Islam was that I saw all of the stories that I had read in the Bible the stories of Ibrahim and Musa and Isa and Ishaq and all of the prophets of Bani Israel I saw all of those stories in the Quran and in the Muslim tradition. So that made me feel like, oh, well, this is familiar territory because I read about all of this stuff in Sunday school, you know? So being coming from that Christian background and then being able to compare the two and then thoroughly analyze a lot of the historical things that I did not realize existed um, in the formation of Christianity, etc., and then comparing everything, I was like, yeah. Islam makes sense. If it's between Islam and Christianity, Islam is the one that makes the most sense for me. How how did your parents take it? How did your friends take it? Because you were only like 13, mashallah, when you converted. Yeah, when I officially took Shahada, I was 13. My, I didn't tell my parents for about two years. But then my mom just kind of realized I was Muslim because she was like, oh, you stopped eating pork. And, and then I think she found me praying one day and then she was just like, yeah, so you're Muslim now. But because they're from Gambia and Gambia is 95% Muslim or something, 
they weren't too unfamiliar with Islam. For them, they were just more worried that I would become an extremist. And when it was clear to them that, you know, my teachers were from Senegal and they knew who my teachers were and they knew the family of my teachers, they're like, okay, well, if this is the Islam you're on, then yeah, we don't have a problem with that. So my family were really, really chill. Um, <clears throat> my friends as well were super chill because in London at that time, everyone that was cool, all the coolest rappers, all the coolest gangsters, they were all Muslim or they all took Shahada. Like anyone that goes to prison and comes out, they take Shahada. And I came from an area, I grew up in like inner city London where it was like, we had gangs in our area. We had, you know, the influence of rappers in our area. We all listened to, you know, particular rappers like I remember back in the day when I was like 11 12 my favorite or 13 14 my favorite rappers were Young Spray and DVS and they were both Muslim and they both openly spoke about Islam in their lyrics and everyone kind of had respect especially in London for Muslims especially like in the black community so it was like me becoming Muslim people kind of respected me for it. They were like, oh, yeah, you're on that Muslim thing. That's cool, man. You go Jumma every Friday and da 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 and the acts and you fast Ramadan and stuff. So it wasn't, I didn't receive any negative pushback from my friends or, you know, my community at the time. I would say even if it, it was the opposite. And it saved me even in certain situations because it's like some of the, gang members that were in my area, some of the people that were the most respected people in my area growing up, I would see them at the mosque. I would see them in Ramadan, <laughs> you know? Like, I remember we had an older, I don't want to say his name, but there was, like, an older guy, and he used to, like, sell drugs in our neighbourhood, and some of the younger people would sell drugs for him and stuff. And I remember Ramadan, and we must have been chilling in, in on the blocks one time, and we saw, and it was Ramadan, so I was getting ready to go Taraweh. And then he came out in his tobe and he was getting ready to go to Taraweh. So he saw us. He was like, oh, you're Muslim. Yeah, yeah, So he put, he paid for the cab for us. So we went to Taraweh and he gave us money and stuff. So then every time I saw him after that, it was like he loved me and he showed me respect because of Islam. So then people in the area now are like, oh, he's cool with that guy. Do you know what I mean? It's stuff like that that affected it affected um, the trajectory of uh yeah, so Islam, it wasn't a problem. It wasn't a problem with family. It wasn't a problem with friends. It wasn't a problem in my area. If anything, it was something that helped me um, and, yeah, brought positive vibes and not negative vibes. Alhamdulillah. That, that situation with that dealer is a bittersweet situation, right? You're like, it's good because he's Muslim, but it's also, he's Muslim. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, every that's the thing. Everyone that's on crazy stuff in, in our area was Muslim. <laughs> like, everyone, all the Why biggest drug dealers, are? all the biggest shooters, all the biggest killers, all the, billi- all the biggest rappers, all the biggest... They're all Muslim. They all took Shahada in prison and they came out and they would at least, even if they were drinking, smoking with girls, whatever, at least every Friday, they'll be in the mosque. And every Ramadan, every night, they're at Taraweeh. And they were visible with their Islam, so... You know, it, Man, it helps spread the reputation of, of, of Islam in the area. To the point that, that there's that, even people that are not Muslim, but they they say stuff like inshallah and alhamdulillah and whatever, just because of the strong Muslim influence in our UK urban culture. And I know in America, it's the same thing. Like I just saw recently Lil Dirk, he put, you know, the masjid in his new music video and everyone's talking about that. But it's something that you can see has a very big uh, impact on the society and on the culture, you know? It sparks a question with me that I've always wondered about. I've always wanted to know why it is that it seems Muslims have, not Muslims, some people, some Muslims tend to be visibly more bad than some or many non-Muslims. Mm. And I'm like, the, does, does Allah like the... The quirky-minded people, the people that are a little crazy but have a lot of goodness in them. But it just always made me wonder, like, what's going on there? Because even me, yeah. like, I'll, I'll tell you, even myself, I'd love for you to answer this if you know the response to this. But I feel like I have a lot of more natural talent and evil than a lot of, like, my non-Muslim <laughs> friends. Right? Like, I'm more capable 
of doing evil things. And I know, like, and I tell myself all the time, all the time, that a hero and a villain are two sides of the same coin. The fact that you're able to, despite all this ability to cause harm, you instead do good is actually better than someone who can't cause harm and doesn't do good either or does good, whatever. Um, so, so I like, I remind myself self with that stuff, but it still makes me wonder like, what's, what's going on there? Even the people that I've seen convert around me in my life have always been some of the most distraught, something happening deep in their life. They've done a lot, committed a lot of sins. Well, like these average people that have, you know, not doing anything crazy, like don't become Muslim. Mm. I remember one of uh, one one of my teachers said, you know, the people that Allah chooses for Islam, a lot of the time or some of the time, they could be people who this is their last chance. So you could just be a normal person living a normal life, and you're not doing anything destructive. So you're on a good path, he said. But then when you're reach the stage where you're at the 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 final point, then Allah can give you Islam as a saving grace that will you know save you and help you. Because even and even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he looked to those kind of people to strengthen Islam. So if you look at the conversion of Sayyidina Umar bin Al Khattab, one of the Sahaba, when Sayyidina Umar took Shahada, he narrated, he said, Allah, he said, Wallahi Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi every night he would pray, Oh Allah, strengthen Islam with the one you love the most from the two Umars, who was Abu Jahl and Umar bin Al Khattab. And if you think about them, they were the two biggest kind of I don't want to say villains, but villains in that society, they were the most powerful people. They were the people that had the most capacity for, you know, they had the most power so they could do the most in the community. And the Prophet ﷺ prayed for Allah to guide one of them to Islam. And we saw the benefit that Islam had through Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu that in the 10 years of him being the Khalifa, that's when most of the Muslim world was one for the Muslims. That's when Egypt became Muslim. That's, that's when the Middle East... Jordan, Palestine, and Syria, and all of those areas, Sham came under the control of the Muslims. That's when the Romans and the Persians were defeated, and you know Islam was spread across most of what we now know today as the Muslim world. And it's because of who Sayyidina Omar was, and the kind of person that he was, and the power and the influence and the resolve that he had. Uh, so without Islam, that has a face, and then with Islam, that has a face. So, you know, I just... What did you mean by that, though, The that it's their last chance? In terms of they're given a second chance or they're given a chance to end up being good rather than just being completely off the rails. So why, I, I, this, this may sound weird, but why then wouldn't Allah choose people that are already at least outwardly good and seem pretty, pretty fairly decent? But instead, you find a lot of the times that he chooses the least likely people, the people that you're like, oh, man, there's this person's doing all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I remember when we were when I used to go to Sunday school, there was a story called the story of the prodigal son. And it was a story that supposedly Jesus told in the in the in the New Testament. And it was about a man that he had a good son and a bad son. And the good son, you know, followed all the rules. He did everything he was supposed to do. And so the dad was OK with him. But then the bad son never did anything right and he, you know, ran away from home and he kept on messing up and he kept on doing things. But then the dad was always reaching out to him more and showing him more mercy to the point that the good son now was like to the dad, look, I do everything right. Why do you seem to care about him more than you care about me? Or why do you seem to show him more love than you show me? And the father said, because he needs it more than you. Like you're doing okay without it. But this person... This my son, he needs my love and my support and my mercy more than you do, which is why it looks like I'm showing him more favor when really I'm just trying to bring him back and make sure that, you know, he, he keeps himself on the straight path. So it's just one of those things that it's a mystery of it's a mystery of life. But sometimes those of us who are the furthest away from Allah will receive the most mercy because Allah wants to bring us back to him, you know. And those people that have the further, the biggest capacity for doing evil will be the person that Allah will choose to become Muslim or to practice Islam because he wants them to use that capacity for evil to turn into being a capacity for good. Because it's potential, like you said, 
it's better for you to be someone that has the ability to do something bad and not do it than somebody that didn't have the ability to do it in the first place. And that's even why Allah chooses mankind over the angels. Because the angels, when Allah was creating Adam and he said, fil ardi khalifa, I'm placing a khalifa on the earth, someone that's going to represent me. The angel said, fiha man fiha wa wa nahnu biham wa He said, why will you choose a creation that's going to cause corruption and bloodshed on the earth? When we're here and we worship you and we praise you and we do everything that we're supposed to do. And Allah told them, I know something you don't know. And then he created Adam. And the story of Adam is a continuous story until us today. But Allah has chosen us and he's given us favor over the angels. Because the angels, they can never do anything that would require them to seek forgiveness from Allah and make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Adam, who had the capacity and did that, did that, Allah says in the Quran, وَتَلَقَّى آدَمَ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتِ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ تُوَابُ الرَّحِيمِ That Adam received words from his Lord and he made tawbah. And so Allah turned to him because Allah is a tawab, the one who accepts tawbah, and a rahim, the one that shows mercy. But if Adam had never sinned, then Allah would never be able to show that he is a tawab al rahim So that's a part, mm. part of the secret of these kind of things that Allah has aspects of himself that he can only manifest through these certain people. If there's no one to sin, Allah can't show that he's Al-Ghafur, the one that forgives sins. If there's no one that deserves mercy, Allah can't show that he's Ar-Rahim. If there's no one to do Tawbah, then Allah can't show that he is a tawab And all of these are attributes that are pre-eternal. They were, they, Allah has always been that. And so he needs to be able to manifest these aspects of his character and show himself. And so he does that through these kind of situations. That is mind blowing. I've never, I've never even heard of this. He just threw me off completely there. <laughs> like I, I'm so, I'm so mind blown by that. Alhamdulillah. I've always, I've always loved this story. And you speak about it in Beyond Bilad, uh, the story of Ubeda bin Samit uh, mm -hmm. in Egypt when he was leading the Muslim army. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a short narration of what happened between him and the Egyptian ambassador or king? Yeah. Uh, Ubadah bin Samit, essentially, and this is a very interesting story for a number of reasons. So the Prophet وسلم, after Fatah al-Makkah, after the opening of Mecca, he sends delegations and he sends letters to the different kings of the earth. And the people who receive these letters and receive these delegations. Najashi of Ethiopia, the king of Yemen, the king of Bahrain, the Caesar of Rome, the Caesar of Rome, which is the leader of the Byzantine Empire, which was ruling most of the Middle East at the time, and the Mokaukis of Egypt. And so why the Mokaukis is an interesting figure is for many reasons, but the first reason is that he was the ruler of Egypt at the time of the Prophet وسلم, but he was placed there as a ruler by the Romans because Egypt was a Roman territory. And his name, al muqawqis is also interesting because it means literally the Caucasian. So it shows you that Egypt at the time was a place where many different people were converging and the ruling classes of Egypt at the time were not real Egyptians, but they were Greeks and Romans. Even if we look at the last pharaoh, Cleopatra, whose story recently has caused controversy, Cleopatra was Macedonian, which is near Greece. So she was Greek Macedonian in origin. She wasn't even Egyptian. And so the final dynasty that ruled Egypt, the Ptolemaic dynasty, were Greeks. And then after them, the Romans came in and took over, and they made Egypt one of the territories of the Roman Empire. So you can see in the north of Egypt, a lot of the people that are there are descended from these people, the Greeks and the Romans, and then afterwards the Arabs and the Turks who came in and established themselves in Egypt. Ubadah bin Sami is a black Arab from the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ, and he comes to deliver this letter to Maqawqis. And Maqawqis looks at him and he says, can you not find anyone better than this ugly you know, black guy to come and give me the message? He shows his racism and his anti-blackness. But then the Muslims say, well, you know, he is the best amongst us. And blackness to us is not a defect. It's not something that we look down upon. We're not racist. And then he delivers a speech. And at the end of the speech, he says, and if you're 
if you are disturbed by my appearance, then you should know that there are hundreds more who are blacker than me and look more scarier than I do with the Prophet wasallam. For me, it's an interesting story because it shows you many different things. It shows you, number one, the anti-blackness that was prevalent in other societies, specifically the Greek or Roman societies, uh, compared to the egalitarian spirit that existed in the community of the Prophet wasallam. And then also just historically, the 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 color and the the influence and the power politics of all of these people in places that you know we never think of when we think of these things, such as in Egypt and all of these places. But yeah, it's an interesting story. There's many oh, others my, like that in Beyond Villa. My my favorite part of that story it it made me so proud of of being Muslim and the history of it. Is when they were saying, like, Wallahi, I swear by God, he is the most knowledgeable of us. He's the most well-spoken of us. He's the most eloquent of us. He's the most elegant. And they, they just, they went down the line. Like, he's better than us in every way. He's the most strongest of us. So yeah. they didn't even just tell him, you know, like, you're a racist and that's it. They were like, here's how wonderful this guy that you brought down is. Yes. And that, because he gave them an option too. Like, the king basically told them. Give me someone else. They could have easily been like, okay, here's another guy. They were like, they refused. They're like, no, no, this is your only option right here. This is our leader. Mm-mm-mm. Yeah, alhamdulillah. It's a beautiful story. So one thing that you said that shocked me is that in the in Beyond Belad is that you, you said that Ali ibn Abi Talib and Omar ibn Khattab may have been black. Yeah, in terms of you know now there's this whole thing of racialization where when people think of black. They don't think of the actual skin complexion, but they think of a specific demographic of people in a specific area. So when you say black, I'm not saying they were African-American. I'm not saying they were West African. But I'm saying if you were to take them and place them in modern day society in places where black people are, they would be racialized as being black because of their skin complexion and because of their physical features. So when we hear about the historical narrative of uh, Bilal al-Habashi, who came from Ethiopia, he was half Arab, half Ethiopian, and he was known as the, an African, he was known as a black person historically, even the whole title Beyond Bilal is around the fact that Bilal is usually the token black guy when it comes to speaking about Islamic history. Bilal and Sayyidina Ali were both described as having the exact same skin complexion, which was Adam, Shadid al Utma. they were very, very dark skin. So if you look at me, they would have been darker than me, both of them, Ali and Sayyidina uh, uh, Bilal. And so that shows you that historically, when we look back at these figures, the way that we racialize people today, if we apply those same standards to the historical figures, many of the people who we look at historically as being you know, non-black would have been racialized today as black. And so when we have this anti-blackness and when we have racism and when we have colorism and we have all of these things, it's important for us to look back at the people who are the most revered people in our tradition and realize that if you have those internal biases against dark-skinned people or against black people, then that means if you were alive at the time of these great people or if these great people were alive in our time, you would treat them in the same way and you'll have the same biases towards them. That was something that I wanted to, to, to highlight to show how important it is for us to remove these things from our hearts as Muslims and just as human beings in general um, because all of these people that we supposedly revere and we supposedly love and respect were people who, if we applied the same standards and the same way in which we look at black people upon them, we would look at them in the same way. Was that... Remind me if I'm mistaken. I always get this wrong. Wasn't Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, from the family of the Prophet, peace be upon him? He was from the family of the Prophet, sallallahu So his father, Abu Talib, and the Prophet's father, Abdullah, had the same father, Abdul Muttalib. So how could, from his mother probably? get No, uh, even from his father. <laughs> because there's a scholar called Al-Jahiz, who... Um, he was a Afro-Arab scholar from the uh, Abbasid period, and he wrote a book called Fakhr al-Sudan al-Baydan. So it was essentially the pride of black people over white people because he was sick of being the victim of racist abuse. And so he decided to write a book that was kind of flipping the script. And in that book, he actually spoke about the fact that, you know, the original Arabs, 
they weren't the same color as the Arabs we know today. Because people that we classify as Arab today, most of them are not really Arab. They're people who have become Arabized over time. So if you look at people in Sham, if you look at people like Syrians, Lebanese, Jordanians, Palestinians, etc., these are people who historically, they were Phoenician and they were Roman. And then when the Arab rule came, they learned Arabic, they intermarried with Arabs, and so they became Arab, and they called themselves Arab. But if you look at them genetically, they have more Phoenician blood and Roman blood than Arab blood. If you go to Egypt, people who today classify themselves as Arab in Egypt, if you look historically, a lot of them have Coptic blood, a lot of them have Greek blood and Roman blood, a lot of them have Turkish blood from the Ottomans, and they have become Arabized. So even the last king of Egypt, if you look at like Muhammad Ali Basha and King Farouk, they were Albanian originally. It was an Albanian general under the Turkish Ottomans that came to Egypt. They learned Arabic, they intermarried with Arabs, and then they called themselves Arabs, but originally they're European. So Jahiz points out that he says the family of the Prophet Sallallahu the sons of Abu Talib were all described as being dark skinned. They were described as being either Aswad, black, or or um Adam, very, very dark skinned. And something that historically points to the fact is the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu had an aunt called Um Hakim. Her nickname was Al Bayda, the white one. Why would you need to call one child Al Bayda, the white one? amongst all of the children of Abu Talib. That shows that the majority of them then weren't white. Or the majority yeah. of them then were probably dark, which is why they called her uh, al Baida. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, man, because they were literally in the desert under the heat all the time. How are you going to stay white when you're exactly. in the we're desert under the sun? I even, because, you know, I'm Egyptian, but I don't know what my ancestry.com results would be but even when i go into the in, into the summer i come out of it people think i'm mixed and when i tell them no i'm not mixed there's like they're, you're like messing with us because it's so definitive in their mind in america like oh you're that dark you're you're half black there's yeah, no way yeah. around. okay so another person you talk about is selim suwari or suwar yes yeah, i was fascinated by his method of dawah i, I it's because I've always preached this method of Tao. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I, I think a lot of people online, whether through YouTube or shorts and reels, TikToks, whatever it is, I don't know, for maybe for the views, but their method of Tao is not something I, I enjoy. I don't like this whole, let's argue in the street and take <laughs> video record it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm exactly like you. Like being from the UK, especially, that's the predominant um that's the predominant theme of Dawa in the UK or well, yeah. for people that are famous for Dawa online. That's how they're famous for Dawa through confronting people in the street, recording videos, ripping off their tops, doing all that kind of stuff. And that's something I've never really vibed with. Just being from that West African tradition, that's something that's not part of our tradition, number one. And then number two, just seeing the way in which the West is, I don't think that's the most conducive way of calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so anytime I go to America, people always ask me, oh, do you know Dawa person so-and-so? Or do you know Dawa person? I'm just like, bro, I don't, I don't know them. Because I was never even in the places where people will be there doing all of that stuff um, for me to even become familiar with them. So, yeah, but we're famous in the... The UK Muslims in, a, in the States are famous for that, I think. Yeah. Which is unfortunate, but yeah. Alhamdulillah, it is what it is. <laughs> it reminds me, I think it was Imam Abu, Han- Imam Abu Hanifa. I believe he was very famous for his debates and eloquent debates in the streets mm-hmm. with, with atheists and agnostics. And I heard a story once where his son basically took on, succeeded him in, in this debating in the streets. Mm-hmm. And then one one time his son was really going going at it and, and beating this this atheist or agnostic in a in a religious debate uh, and he was like in his mind he was thinking oh my my father abu hanifa is going to be so proud i'm doing such a great job and he found abu hanifa just walking away and, and he runs after him afterwards and goes why'd you leave why why are you walking away why why'd you leave uh when i was in the middle of the debate and he said because it didn't seem like he wanted to mend hearts or build a bridge between them or 
tug at his heartstrings or actually have a, a genuine conversation, it seemed like you guys were, were intending on beating the person in front of you. And look at how I destroyed him. Look how I beat him. Look how I embarrassed him. I gotcha, gotcha moment. And I thought that was, that was very beautiful is that many Muslims th don't realize this, but Islam and religion and, and Allah is a battle of the hearts. It's not, all, it's not a battle of the minds. Even the people who are atheists, they'll tell you a bunch of logical reasons behind why they do the things or why they believe the things they believe. But if you really sit down and talk to them, there's an emotional reason why they don't believe in God. It's not a logical reason. Yeah, usually it's not. It's not a, a logical reason. And even before all of that, I just feel like when it comes to da'wah, Allah has given us a methodology of how to give da'wah in the Qur'an. When Allah talks about da'wah, we see him say, ila sabili rabbika bil hikma wa mawizatil hasana. Call to the path of Allah with wisdom and with good speech. You know? وَجَادِلُهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنَ And then when you argue with people, argue with them in the best way or in the way that's best. So it's always up to us to look at these three things. Hikmah, wisdom. Mawizatil hasana, making sure that our speech is the best of speech. We're calling people in a good way. And then وَجَادِلُهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنَ And then if it gets to the stage where you're arguing with people, you do it in a way that you're arguing with them with what is better and you're arguing with them with what is best. But like shouting and doing all these kind of things. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not personally a fan. That's not my way. And if you look historically in the Muslim world, that's not the way that was the most successful way in places where Islam was spread through da'wah and Islam was established and has still been established until today. So if you look at the largest country in the world, which is Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world, which is Indonesia, I think there's, you know, I don't, I don't want to give estimates of the number and get it wrong, but I know it's the largest Muslim country in the world. They were never ruled by Arabs or, you know, they were never ruled by the Khilafah. It was nine people, and they called them the Wali Songo, the, the nine friends of Allah, who literally moved into the area from Yemen. Some of them were traders, some of them were teachers, some of them were craftsmen, etc., and just through their interacting with the people and their, their, their you know, living amongst these non-Muslims, they ended up converting all of these people to Islam. And then Islam now has been so firmly established in Indonesia that it's, you know, the largest Muslim country in the world. None of them argued with people or did all of these kind of crazy publicity stunts to bring people to Islam. But it was a very natural process. And the same thing with the Salim Suare uh, method the Suarian method in West Africa, where they didn't call to Islam through jihad and they didn't call to Islam through, you know, all of these things. It was literally through trade and through education and through providing service to the local communities. Community was, service. When, yeah, it was trade, education, and community service. Those were the three things that won people over to Islam in West Africa. And we know now how established Islam is in West Africa. And it was through people who followed this this method of da'wah, this historical method of da'wah. So I feel like if we want to give da'wah in the West, that would be the best method to give da'wah as well, because that's what worked for those before us. And logically, that looks like what will work for us the best as well. You, you said that there's a, a lot of Islam, anti-Islam Afrocentrists and Orientalist scholars that try to say that Islam was spread by the sword in West Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, your, you, and your book and Beyond Bilal highlight a different history, uh, and you talk about how Islam entered Ghana. How did Islam enter Ghana or Ghana? Yeah, so it's interesting. Islam entered Ghana, and this is historical Ghana, which is in modern day Mali and Mauritania. Islam entered there through trade, and what's interesting is that the Orientalist scholars like to say that Islam entered the region in the 1300s when the Almoravids, who were Moroccan, attacked the empire. But we have first-hand accounts of people from as early as the 11th century, so 200 or 300 years before that, speaking about the fact that the capital city of the empire had 12 mosques, and the king, who wasn't Muslim, loved the Muslims so much that he built a masjid in his palace so that if he had Muslim guests, they could pray in his palace. And this was all through peaceful interaction and trade. 
and that his interpreter and the ministers in his government and the person in charge of his treasury were all Muslims who were native to his kingdom but who had converted to Islam. So we can see that Islam was spreading then. It was spreading just through peaceful interactions and trade. Muslims coming in, settling into society, living amongst the people, praying, building their masajid, local people interacting with them, becoming curious, curious, converting to Islam, and not forcing them to convert to their religion, and the Muslims not forcing the non-Muslims to convert to their religion. Everyone was doing their own thing, and it was peacefully interacting. For most of the history of West Africa, it's been like that. And so why I find that interesting is because for the people that like to say Islam was spread by the sword in West Africa or through the Arab slave trade, which is something that even just the wording of it and the narrative that they give is very, very deceptive of the, the Arab slave trade. All of these things were secondary to the spread of Islam and they did not and the, the first-hand accounts of Africans who were write, writing their own history and for foreign people who were interacting with West Africans at the time and writing history contemporarily at that time all, place, uh, all show a completely different picture from the picture that's being pushed by a lot of these Afrocentric scholars and these um, neo-Orientalist scholars. Yeah. So can you tell me... Um... Speaking of that, the, the knowledge stored and the, the level of knowledge stored and taught at Sankor University. Mm -hmm. That was fascinating when you were talking about that in the book. Yeah, so Sankor University was interesting. It was a conglomerate of three different masajid in Mali, the Sankor Mosque and the Sidi Yahya Mosque um, and another mosque. And they had classes in between these three masajid and they ended up building a library of over 700,000 manuscripts, which is the largest library in the history of Africa since the Library of Alexandria. And the Library of Alexandria was destroyed. So that means that this was the largest library in Africa at the time. And what's interesting is that they were teaching not only Islamic sciences, but they were teaching mathematics, they were teaching philosophy, they were teaching science, they were teaching medicine, they were teaching all of the different things that make you know any modern curriculum law and all of these different things and google has recently and it's interesting google has a project to preserve these manuscripts and it's called the timbuktu something project i think if you just go to google and you type in timbuktu manuscripts google itself has created a whole page where they have a database and you can go through the different books that they've been scanning and digitizing because of you know the environment and also the political situation in Mali with the um, Islamic extremists burning books and taking over cities and doing certain things. There's been a push by Western academ academics and different organizations to try and preserve and digitize these manuscripts because it's a legacy of human you know knowledge and it's a legacy of of, of history, not just black history, not just West African history, but human history that a lot of people didn't know about because many people know about the universities of Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale that have existed for the past couple of hundred years. Even going further back, the House of Wisdom in Baghdad and Karawin University in uh, Morocco and the Zaytuna University in Tunis and Al Azhar in Egypt. But many people didn't know about this West African university, which was the Sankore University which was on the same level, if not a higher level, than all of these other universities and teaching the same kind of things. But because of the neglect that was shown to West African culture and civilization, unfortunately, the legacy of that was lost. But alhamdulillah, people know about it now and they're trying to preserve it. You said uh, in your book that they even had detailed medical textbooks explaining how to conduct eye cataract removal operations. Yes. Thousands of verses of poetry translated and commented on, not just in Arabic, but in local West African languages using the tradition of a Jami script. Like you said, science, mathematics, philosophy, astronomy, uh, 700,000 manuscripts, 25,000 students. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, yeah, like you're saying, I never knew about this stuff. Yeah, nobody knows about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> SubhanAllah. Um, tell, me, uh, tell me about the short-lived... The most tell me about the most short-lived empire in African history and the heartfelt story of Samari Tor. 
traveling Tory, maybe. I don't know. Tra- trading himself in for his mother to be spared. That was such a cool story. Yeah, yeah. Somebody today. It's an interesting one. So he lived in what we now know today as Guinea and Sierra Leone. And um, he established a Muslim and Islamic empire. So there was tribal warfare happening between his tribe and some of the other tribes. And his mother was actually kidnapped in one of these intertribal conflicts. And so he went to the people that had taken his mother and he swapped himself for his mother. And so he became their captive and then he ended up being recruited into their army, studying the way that they practiced war, etc., and becoming a general. And then he led his own army and kind of established his own empire. And he used his empire as a base to not only protect and preserve Islam in West Africa, but to fight against the colonial powers that were trying to take over West Africa at the time. Um, Unfortunately, he was defeated. His empire was very short-lived because it only lasted in his lifetime. And when he passed away, his great-grandson or his grandson, Sekou Toure, became the first president of Guinea when it became independent from the French. So even though the French had defeated him, when independence was achieved by his country, it was somebody from his family that ended up leading the country uh, in independence. So, alhamdulillah. For anyone who went on a daze there for a second, <laughs> what, what the sheikh just said is, this man was an elite in his country or empire or village. And then his mother got captured. He traded himself in for his mother and then became an elite. <laughs> and a powerful man in the people that captured his mother he trained that's that's insane to be able to do that yeah i feel like all of these stories are things that need to be made into movies and tv series and shows and stuff i feel like that's the next step in preserving exactly this is something that we need to kind of make into- you know it's interesting that you're saying about that like my the podcast is actually my first like media project and what I'm really trying to get to is that. Like, I'm trying to build a media company where I could start doing stuff like that. Inshallah. Inshallah. May Allah put barakah in it and allow it to happen. Inshallah. I mean, um, so I, I feel like you're probably pretty tired at this point. I know it's late over there. Dan, we've done an hour and a half. So what we can do, we can kind of, we can end it here and then we'll come back for another session. Inshallah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hope. All right. Because we'll we a- still have... Uh, you, we still have your your awesome theory that African Muslims got to Americas before Columbus, mm-hmm. um, and and your theory about most of the slaves in the transatlantic slave trade were Muslims, uh, and then you know Charles V implementing a rule not to take Muslims anymore, which I think is so mind blowing that that was like. <laughs> He was like, stop going for these Muslims, man. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, the unknown history of black Muslims in South America. Uh, Abdurrahman ibn Sori, the prince among slaves. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we cover have... that on next episode, inshallah, and more, inshallah. Okay, okay. <laughs> that that would be perfect. So, I'm... Sheikh Mustafa, thank you so much, man. Yeah. Are you a doctor? Should I be calling you doctor, too? Nah, nah, I'm good. I'm... <laughs> I feel like you're a doctor. <laughs> and you're not telling me. Not yet, not yet. (laughs) (laughs) This is the Ansari Podcast.